Welcome to Beans and Breakdowns, a podcast dedicated to bridging the gap between specialty copy and the heavy music community. On this episode, I'm joined by Riz Faruqi, vocalist for the band King Lychee, and also the founder of UniteAsia.org, one of the largest publications for hardcore punk and metal in all of Asia. So grab a fresh cup of coffee and wake the fuck up! What's going on, Caffeinated Crew? This evening for me, but morning for him, uh, I I am joined by Riz from the band Dagger, the band King Lychee, mm-hmm. the band Regret, the founder of Unite Asia. What what am I missing here? No, I Is think, that, I think I you got all? it all, bro. <laughs> did I get all of it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? I'm doing all right, man. Um, I'm just, I'm really, really excited for this conversation. I am also extremely excited. Uh, all day, I've kind of been in the back of my mind, like thinking about, uh, just talking about like what we're going to get into, having these questions. I didn't want to stress too much about the questions because <laughs> I like it to be organic, but there's a lot of stuff that I want to know. I feel yeah. like over here, we don't get uh, a super clear picture of Asian hardcore in general, but also you're being based in Hong Kong what that looks like currently and the political climate that, that you're in and yeah, just all around, like we haven't had anyone on the podcast from uh, that side of the world yet. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot that you're giving me this time. Let's start it off. Right. What are you drinking? Dude, this is what I've been drinking. I had to go get the bag for you because you are such a connoisseur. Like I was like, I've been listening to all your podcasts. I'm like, damn, I don't even know where the beans are from. So this is what I drink. It's called Tostini Cafe. Um, okay. it's an Italian import that you can get it only at one store in Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong is like, we got, we got almost 8 million people for there to be one store that sells this in the city is bananas. So I went to the store yesterday. I, was, I just ran out of it. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, this is the stuff I like. I like a really strong coffee. I still like it with milk though. I'm still definitely a milk yeah. because I'm, I'm Pakistani. It's Pakistani. We love milk tea. Do you guys, have you guys ever heard of that? I, I've, I've had some milk tea. I haven't had Pakistani milk tea, but I've had uh, like Vietnamese or variations of milk tea. So Yeah, yeah you talk about on the Pete's episode, the one about with the condensed milk. I mean, we do that here too. Um, mm-hmm. a, a, your wife will know this because in Hong Kong, it, because it used to be a British colony, they brought all that in, that culture in. And like right. Hong Kong has its own version of milk tea that is just, oh my God, it's so good. I might have to see if uh, we have a Chinatown section of Montreal. Uh, maybe I can get the the I can get the lowdown on where to get the good milk tea. Yeah, but I definitely you've got me wanting one really bad now. So maybe <laughs> maybe tomorrow I'll be somebody will catch me in Chinatown looking for a milk tea. <laughs> as long as that Chinatown's got Cantonese people in it, you'll you'll definitely find. I think there might be a few spots, so we'll we'll have to check it out. <laughs> I'll get the lowdown. We'll see what happens. Um. I'm drinking a coffee that was sent to me from the wonderful boys, uh, Jesse from Anarchy Coffee Roasters. And they're in British Columbia. I think they're in Kelowna. Please don't hate me, Jesse, if I'm getting this wrong. But it is their decaf because currently it's 10, 15 p.m. (laughs) in the beautiful city of Montreal. So I'm drinking their decaf. It's called The Straight Edge. No, that's amazing. Yes, it's amazing. Dude, you got to tell me, so if it's decaf, is it, so it's not as strong tasting? What, what is decaf? So it's not caffeinated coffee. Right. It's so they use something in, in specialty coffee. Uh, they use something called a Swiss water process. It's, it's, they, they make it, it's decaffeinated coffee. Um, but I love it because they called it the straight edge. So yeah. I had to have it. That's amazing. I love that it's called straight edge. I, would, I mean, yes. like I know about decaffeinated. I just I wondered if it impacted the, the taste of the, the beans. So in commodity coffee, so like in a lot of like your more commonly found grocery store decafs, they use a more chemical process using like formaldehyde and, and similar chemicals to extract the coffee. So it makes it taste really weird and gross. Yeah. The water process has a bit of a different um, impact on the coffee. It doesn't necessarily change the taste too much. Nice. Um, 
but this is a blend. This is a Central America, Ethiopian, and Indonesian, um, and it tastes like chocolate and vanilla. That's it's pretty okay. good. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So I haven't had a lot of decaf recently, but I thought it. I thought it was a great opportunity to dive in. <laughs> to <a> decaf. <laughs> Coffee at ten p.m. Man. <laughs> Hell yeah! Cheers. Cheers. So. Is there a big coffee culture in Hong Kong? I know that since it was a British colony, there's a lot of tea, obviously. But is there a, a great coffee culture going on? Yeah, I mean, I'm not that big of a coffee connoisseur. I do drink lots of coffee every day. <laughs> uh, but, um, I'm not that picky about it. Um, the, yeah, there, are, there are a lot of coffee shops in Hong Kong. A lot of mm-hmm. independent ones, too. Um, especially the past couple of years, all the political stuff going on. It's been, it's been really cool to kind of see um, business people being a little bit more savvy and being a little bit more about, well, this is where I stand on certain things. And so those kind of coffee shops have just kind of exploded all over the city. Nice. So that has been great. That's awesome. You, you spoke about the political climate and the impact, um, getting into the Hong Kong scene. I know that you are credited specifically with being the quote unquote father of the Hong Kong scene coming back and establishing a uh, uh, King Lychee after coming from university. Um, I mean, I guess start from talk about what it's like now and what yep. the impact of everything that's been happening in the past 10 years or more um, with kind of the phasing out of it being the British and the handover and the specifics that I'm not saying right now, but <laughs> like just what's, what has been going on with the Hong Kong scene? What's it look like right now? Um, I, I don't know, man. It's, it's been hard to kind of talk about it because we're also not sure what we can or can't say. I think mm-hmm. that in itself is very telling, right? Um, uh, I, I've always been very open about my thoughts about things prior to this new thing called a national security law going in, into right. in, action two, yeah, two years ago. Uh, prior to that, I couldn't care less. I would say whatever I wanted to say, make videos about whatever. And that was like the beauty of Hong Kong. You know what I mean? Like Hong Kong being part of China. But after 97, when we got handed back to China, uh, the concern was that, you know, the mainland Chinese would come in and just, you know, shut this down, shut that down. And it did not get shut down. It was incredible. So what actually happened was, the, the more opposing voices, and it's not really opposing, it's just a different voice, right? A different voice in the establishment. So th- those voices just got louder and more, and more just empowered. It was amazing. It was super, super amazing because you would see these people say things on the streets of Hong Kong. Um, and then if you stepped over the border, which is only 40 minutes away, uh, you, would, you would get jailed. You, you would just be, you know, you'd be yeah, you literally vanish, right? They would just take you away right. once you, your families don't even know where you are. So in Hong Kong, we just held on to that. Those freedoms that we love so much, we held on to it. And up until uh, 2019, when all the stuff started going down, you know, the government hated it. They didn't like it. They didn't appreciate it or anything like that. But uh, they didn't try to stamp it out. They weren't trying to stamp it out. So, I mean, they're, you know, behind the scenes things that have been happening in Hong Kong. I mean, it's a very complex city, right? It's, it's so... Even me talking about it right now, I'm like, how far back should I go? Should I talk about that? I mean, there's a there's a lot of changes um, and a, a lot of things that people who live here, that, that live and breathe Hong Kong, that have enjoyed the freedoms that we had, have really gone out of their way to protect it and be like, this is what makes Hong Kong special. Don't take this away. And that's what happened in 2019. So 2019, it was a massive social movement that was kickstarted by this weird behind the scenes way of introducing a new law an extradition mm-hmm. law a law that um if you did something in uh in in china but you're a hong kong citizen and you come back to hong kong they would china could come and take you back and people are like what you can't do that because the reason why people are like you can't do that is because the legal system is so different in china and the legal system in hong kong is so different because hong kong mm-hmm. is and I'm, I don't want to say this in like a civilized, unsolved manner. I don't mean that at all. I just mean that because we were under British rule for so long, uh, the laws and the practices that were in place in Hong Kong for decades were sound, sound, very human rights based. So that you know you're 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 innocent until you're proven guilty. Uh, um, you can take you can bail will always be approved, like stuff like that. 
Um, so people were nervous about that weird extradition. Like, what? I can be sent to like. So that kickstarted a massive movement, and then it just butted heads. Um, there was just a lot of talk about the failure of introducing uni- universal suffrage to Hong Kong, so that we could pick our own leaders. Um, and then it just you know it was like a firebomb. Man. It was like a firebomb mm-hmm. exploded in Hong Kong. Um, things. I mean, like I'm very socially aware, socially active. Always protested because we've always had that right in Hong Kong to be able to do that. Like literally, you can hand whatever sign you can imagine at protests with millions and millions and millions of people. You couldn't believe it. Like you're like, man, I can't believe we're getting away with that sign or that sign is crazy. There is no way those signs would ever come back now. And so that is like, uh, just in a nutshell, it's, it's, it's heart-wrenching to see the city being all the, the civil, civil organizations that we've had, human rights, the press freedoms, the freedoms that we've all loved and enjoyed that's made Hong Kong what it is, is has been slowly been taken away. And so it's hard. It's hard right now. I mean, like I and my band Dagger, uh, you know, prior to the national law going into place in 2020, without public consultation, without any idea what is legal, what's not legal, they put in place. At, we had no idea. July 1st, 2020, suddenly the flag that I was holding the day before is now illegal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and illegal to the point where I could be in jail for 10 years because it's it, quote unquote subversive, even if it's not what it's all about. Like it's, it's insane. So even with my band, like Dagger, we've, we've deleted music videos. We've taken lyric videos off just because we don't know. We just don't know what's, mm-hmm. what's okay. Even when I type things, I type, retype, delete, show my wife. Like It's stuff that I never imagined I would have to do. But that's the reality now. So I, I know that I had seen some videos from Dagger, I think prior to the law being introduced and some of the very outspoken visuals and, and lyrics, like what you're saying. Um, in hardcore in Hong Kong, what has this, what kind of effect has this kind of had? Like how, how has the scene, is the scene kind of diminished? Is it seen as subversive to have even a hardcore show? Like what is going on in Dude, that arena? It, it's crazy. I mean, I can only t- talk about the current state, right? I mean, the current state, I know you're in Canada. I think Canada is pretty much open back up, right? From the yeah. COVID restrictions. I mean, we still have them here, man. We still have mm-hmm. like a full on mask. You can only have four people sitting at a table in a restaurant. Um, venues, uh, bars can't have live bands play yet. I mean, this is 2022 and we're about to be in August. Um, so this is how nuts it is here. Prior to 2019, I would say prior to 2019, I could have flown any band into Hong Kong, any band. Any band, I wouldn't need the paperwork. I don't wouldn't need to worry about anything. Promote it like crazy, like you know, plaster walls on the streets. Now, if I put on a show, literally the show that King Lashi just played, uh, July sixteenth, which was two Saturdays ago, I couldn't put the venue name on the poster. Uh, so it, that's our new thing right now. That if people are putting on shows, um, you can't put venue names on. It's called, it's like you know, show here, a t- uh, sorry, a date here, time here. Ticket price, uh, DM for details. Like that's yeah. literally what we have to do now when we put on shows. Uh, and and this particular venue that we put up played uh, a couple weeks ago, we even needed to have like, one of our dudes stand at the entrance downstairs at the bottom of the building just in case anyone would come in. So it's just uh, any police or anyone that would yeah. come in and uh, raid the place. I mean that's. It's just unbelievable, man. I'm 45, so I've I've lived a different time of Hong Kong, and so to live into in this era of Hong Kong is taking a uh, a lot of adjusting and a lot of like heart wrenching. Like I can't believe this is this is the the Hong Kong that the young the young generation now they're living this version of Hong Kong, which is unbelievable. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, even from this side, seeing everything that was happening uh, in 2019 that you were mentioning and and all of the riots and everything, it was very scary watching it on the BBC and, you know, Associated Press and kind of show you what was going on, like, like in a non-biased way. So I hope that you can kind of feel the sentiment from this side of the hardcore scene. Like we're like, I'm, I'm with you. Like it's, it's hard to watch like our brothers and sisters kind of suffer like that. I appreciate that. You know, I appreciate like a lot of people, it's hard to say. I mean, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I know you've been in hardcore for a while. I've been hardcore for a while. It's, it's interesting, the current state of hardcore and how 
a lot of bands don't really have much of a social or political message in their music and lyrics. It's all about being as hard as possible. Which, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I get it, which I totally get it. That's how I got into the music. I was like, you know, I, I, I came from the world of metal. So it was like, the, yeah. it was the heaviness of the music that first got me in. But it was always the lyrics, man. It was always the lyrics, always the political stuff, the social stuff, the you know, the yeah. anti-racist sentiment, like the anti-fascist sentiment. All those things was what got me into hardcore. So the past couple of years, I'm like dying to find a band that <laughs> speaks my language and empowers me more. I'm like, where is that band? I can't find those lyrics. And I'm like going back to like sick of it all or whatever. Like, you know, yeah. the bands that were a little bit more open about like, uprising nation and stuff like that and like in my head i'm like oh thank god these songs exist but how scary that that band will probably never be able to play here again you know what i mean like there's there's yeah. there's only layers to like the, the current situation yeah I, I i know what you mean seeing some of these like i guess some of the younger uh like coming up the younger generation it's it's a bit odd to see what what they're because a lot of things have kind of been progressively in north america things are a bit more figured out i guess sort of mm. out um so there's not kind of a lot to you know rebel against i guess in the u.s now there is because they've, they've kind of fucked a bunch of stuff up recently but a whole bunch um, of things i mean that's a whole different conversation too yeah but. i don't i honestly don't <laughs> even want to get into that uh um we, yeah we we got to mess over there um but you know i even see bands like god's hate if you listen to some of their lyrics it it does remind me of some like like uh What's the one kill them all is yeah. basically, I think it's about killing racists yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in like inbred Nazis. I think that that's pretty fun to listen to, but for sure, because yeah. you know, like, like you said, with the bands, like God's hate stuff, I mean, their, their music is so pummeled. Like it's just <laughs> like, you know, like Taylor, it's like he, he mixed our, the early dagger stuff. So mm -hmm. like, I was just like, just fanboying out. I'm like, yo, tell me more about <laughs> Nails, man. What's going on with Nails? <laughs> it's like, you know, like God's hate his, and his other band, Disgrace. Have you heard that one? He's the one that he sings I, in that band. I haven't heard it yet, but I've... Oh, dude, so heavy. Like, I'm like, dude, get that band back together. But yeah, like bands like God's hate, it's just like the music is so pummeling. And like, and luckily, like you're right, right? There are, of course, I don't mean like to, you know, like all the current bands aren't singing about it. Of course they are. It's just like, it's not, I, I'm still looking for that thing. That's a little bit more like in your face about certain politics mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right? Yeah. Uh, there, I've, I've been talking to some of my friends that are punks here in Montreal as well. And they're very, very outspoken, like anarcho, um, just anarcho punk, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Like my friend showed me some artwork that he made recently and it's one of the leaders of the the province here uh that is pretty racist and he has like a it's like a black and white picture of him with a bullet hole in his head and like the name of their band i'm like that might be the most offensive artwork i've seen in like five years at least yeah so, yeah yeah that's what i'm talking keeping about it real <laughs> yeah that's what i'm talking about it's like that kind of controversial i don't know just uh, that stance is what I'm, i feel yeah. like i'm missing a lot with with and yeah i mean like you're saying there's a billions of bands i can't just be like yeah all the current bands hell no man the current bands like i mean if you want to take it just musically like the current state of hardcore the bands are have been so good like it is insane to me how good the bands have gotten and we've moved away from like one hardcore sound like to mm -hmm. me there was a period i don't know if you remember like every band sounded like terror right every yep. band had like a backtrack vibe to it now it's just like open feel like that band Soul Blind, I'm like, what? What am I? What am I listening to right now? This is the best shit, and I can't believe that hardcore has gotten to that place where, like, yo, anything flies, man. Anything. Let's add that. Add shoegaze. Add some grunge. Whatever you want, Let's put it in here, and people love it. It's such a cool state. Yeah. Even like crossing into some like death metal and slam and stuff like that. Yeah. I love how how broad hardcore has gotten. Yeah, like, there's a a flavor for everybody, but it's more, I guess, more on the mindset now. And yes. It's kind of the idea behind it where it's like, I'm still DIY. I still believe in like the scene as being a family and, and supporting one another. But I'm going to play some fucking crazy ass slam music and talk about like gore for yeah. an hour. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's exactly where it is right now. And it's funny because yeah. I think like you're, uh, you're saying too, like uh, I, I think why bands have been more brazen about 
adding this element or that element, or that element is because we're living in streaming land, right? We're living in a world where people will listen to one song and a 20 other selection will show up on their playlist or whatever it is. And so kids these days are just used to that. They're not listening. They're not yeah. used to just listening to mad ball, like right, all day long, like, they listen to this and then this and then this. And so of course it's showing up in people's music, which is so cool. Yeah, it is. It that aspect of streaming is extremely cool because you have so many influences immediately. Immediately, like we have in, instant gratification on on YouTube, streaming on Spotify, whatever you do. But you don't have to go and look through the booklet of a CD to see yeah. what bands yes. that band is friends with. You don't have to dig through some crates. Like yeah. Uh, so in that aspect, I think it is very interesting. The climate, like you're saying, it's, it is. Yeah, very interesting to to see. Um, mentioning you know, streaming and, and being connected, I guess, like internet wise. Uh, I know that a lot of people watch like YouTube videos to kind of see where hardcore is like, you know, hate five, six, obviously everybody has seen those and one nine seven and things like that. What, I guess what I'm getting at is what is moshing like in Hong Kong? Yeah. I mean, um, Hong Kong, I mean, I could probably go more, uh, uh, just spread out outside of Hong Kong because I mean, luckily yeah. with my band King Lai Chi, like we started in 1999, um, and when we started, like my mindset was already like, dude, I'm not gonna be just a a, a, some, a band that just stays here. I, I just knew that. I just knew that because I love traveling mm-hmm. myself, and I've always wanted to be like, I was always connected to like punk rock and hardcore in Asia anyway. So I was just like, I knew that we would go to the Philippines, we'd go to Malaysia, we'd go to Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, mm-hmm. all these places. That at that time, like I'm talking about 99, like even then they already had pretty massive hardcore community, especially Indonesia. Indonesia is insane in every level. <laughs> it's insane. <Yeah. laughs> Whatever you want. If you want, if you're a sky head, if you're a skinhead, like, oh my God, the scene is for everything is enormous. So like I, in general, what I've noticed is in places where hardcores existed for much longer than Hong Kong. <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> decades, like Philippines has had hardcores since the 80s, Japan too. Yeah. Places where uh, hardcore has been around for a very long time, their moshing and their shows and their like vibe at shows is like, is USA. 100% USA. <laughs> like it's, it is insane. My job as a musician and uh, a member of a band is like to give you 30 minutes of an escape. Um, Mm -hmm. Hong Kong has gone through so much in the past three years. I'm like, if I can give you 30 minutes of joy, you know what I mean? Of joy through some heavy ass music, as long as I'm looking at a sea of smiles instead of dread and hopelessness and tragedy, like that's all I care about, you know? And so let me answer your question. Yeah. Like places like Malaysia and Indonesia, like when the first time I went to Malaysia with King Laishi, it must've been like Oh two maybe or Oh three. And prior to that, I had not gone to Southeast Asia for show. I had, I mean, it was early, like 02, right? And when mm-hmm. I got there and we we played, I could not believe. And remember, I've lived in the States. I was I was there for 94 to 98. So I'd gone mm-hmm. to a hardcore show in that era. Like that's a pretty important era of hardcore, I think. Um in mass, right? You were in you yeah. were like a uh, Western Mass. Yeah, so that's Western. like the hotbed. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Oh my god, it was crazy! I had Zach from Bane live downstairs in my dorm, so yeah, like, <laughs> it was crazy, dude. It was not. It was sucking. In, like for me, like, uh, damn, it was just like I can remember it now, man. As someone that grew up in Hong Kong, we had no shows in the eighties or nineties. No one came mm-hmm. to Hong Kong. No one, literally nobody. So I'd never even been to a concert before, a concert or a show. I had no idea. I didn't even know what the difference was, you know. And I remember like getting to Western Mass, um, Amherst was where I was. And I don't even, just remember no concept of this stuff, right? And like I had like this, this really hippie, grateful, dead loving roommate that I didn't know because I, I was, a, I'm an international student, man. They just put you in, in a room with anybody. It's like, mm-hmm. pray to God this guy understands that Hong Kong is not the capital of Japan or whatever, any dumb question. Like, so he was just like sitting there reading, like, you know, one of those free, uh, newspapers that, that we used to have. I don't remember what it's called. Anyway, they had like show listings in the back. Remember, mm-hmm. I didn't even know what that meant. So he's like looking at shows. He's like, oh, he's like, well, what is this? What's this? Uh, he's like, um, napalm death obituary. I'm like, what? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's just like, oh, these some bands called napalm death and obituary are playing down the street. I'm like, what are you talking? Like, I literally could not 
process anything he was saying. And I speak English. And I was like, wait, what are you, what do you mean? He's like, do you know them? I'm like, of course I know them. What are, what do you mean down the street? What does that mean? He's like, oh, it's like a 20 minute drive. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> He's like a grateful dead fish head. And so that was my first experience was going to like an underground venue called Pearl Street in Northampton, which is 20 minutes outside of Amherst. Uh, going downstairs, walking into like just death metal. I had never, I've never seen it before. I was 17 at the time. And, and I saw John Tardy, like the vocalist with his like whole head of hair. I'm like, there's, there's that magazine cover guy. Like, <laughs> Dude, I was losing it. I'm like, I've seen that guy's head on the back of that CD I own. You're like, oh dude, it was, it was insane. It was insane. That's amazing. It was insane. Yeah. It was crazy. That's, that's beautiful. Um, Wait, what was I talking about before I got into this? You, we, we, we were talking about. <laughs> You came back uh, in, oh, yeah. in 98, 99 for the, in the, yeah, the Hong yeah. Kong scene was, yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry yeah. Just, so I took us down that rabbit hole because yeah. I wanted, I, I, I know that you had spent some time. It's right. I think I was just trying to set the context that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, so when we got to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, like that's when they invited us to come down and play. We got there and we didn't know what to expect either. Like, you know, I'd never seen a show there, but I, I knew they were great bands. So we got there and this band called Second Combat is a straight edge hardcore band, like dude, legendary veterans of the Malaysian hardcore scene, especially the straight edge scene. Um, when they were playing, it was like, I'm like, wait, am I in Asia right now? Like I literally thought I was in New York or Boston or something. The, the crowd had surrounded the band, finger pointing, singing louder than the band. I'm like, I have not seen this in so long. And the craziest thing was they all look like me. You know what I mean? Instead of like, you know, I, I, I don't get me don't get me wrong, but like in, in northeast uh, uh, northeast of uh, USA, there's a lot of white people that are at those shows. And so when I went to the show, and I'm like, everyone's brown. People are wearing hijabs. Girls are wearing hijabs, and they're finger pointing and singing straight edge lyrics. And they're like, you know, like X's on people. I X'd could up. not yeah. believe. I couldn't like it was. Dude, I literally, like, it flipped my mind. Like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I was like, oh, my God, I don't have to go to New York to see this. I don't need to go to the USA to see this, or even London or Europe. I could go to Asia. Like, there's Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and then we just kept on going. We were in Kuala Lumpur, then we went to Singapore, then we went to Bangkok, and, like, this was back in 02. And that's where, like, the whole idea for Unite Asia just began. I'm like, oh, my God, our Asian scene is phenomenal. Why don't people know about it? Right. And that was the seed for everything else I've been doing since then. That's like, I'm so happy that you brought that up uh, about founding Unite Asia through, through touring in, in like Malaysia and Indonesia and stuff. Cause going through the website, like, and this is for the listeners. If you guys run out of bands, if you feel like you're running out of bands from like English speaking areas of the world, predominantly English speaking, go on uniteasia.org right now. And I swear to God, if you start with the first article that's up there, you will have 10 years worth of music to just like go through. Like I, I've been going through some articles. Like I found no excuse. Yo, great, man. What the hell? That shit's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I, I've been discovering new music. And I mean, even through Hate Five Six, they did that Blood Axe tour in, yeah. in 20, was it early 2020, I think? Yeah, yeah. Um, in Japan. Finding sand and palm and like horsehead nebula and cruelty, like those are some of the heaviest fucking heavy. bands I have ever heard. Heavy, yes, absolutely. I mean, and I appreciate that you're part of like that mindset of people who are like, that's what I want. I want to eat this up. I want to know what is beyond like beyond like the cities that are currently popping, like you know, like mm -hmm. the Bay Area, for example, which like tsunamis taking over the world with, right? <laughs> but it's just like uh for uh, for people like you, it's just so cool that they're into they're like, wait, what's going on in Hong Kong? What's going on in Taipei? What's going on in Singapore? And mm -hmm. and with United Asia, like uh, it literally is just a passion project. I don't make any money for it. Really, I've never had any advertising on the site. Um uh so it's just something that started actually I, i'll uh, be very honest it started with my old with king lai chi because i used to have a website with king lai chi called king lai chi.com mm -hmm. and this is, goes back to what you were saying about like you know like when it comes to ideals of hardcore and punk rock and for me why i fell in love with it it's the whole diy culture that's all it is right it's all diy it's like you're you're 
something is missing, go fill it. You know, don't mm-hmm. wait for someone to go do it for you. Just go do it. And so what happened was, I, I was just so like, I just eat music. I consume music. Everything is about music. You know what I mean? Like I'm sitting here in Hong Kong telling you about the Bay Area video that went off. And I'm like, <laughs> what? That's crazy. That how that tsunami is like first show and they're playing in front of 2,000 people. I'm in Hong Kong telling you about that. Right. Um, so what it was, it's just that um, every morning I had this practice. I would just get up in the morning, have my coffee or get my milk tea, whatever it is, and just start looking at Metal Sucks, Lamb Goat, uh, you know, and all the big websites, the big music website, the heavy music website. And after a while, I was just like, damn, why don't, it, this is great to hear about these bands, you know, and like, I, I probably will never see them or whatever, but what about this band from Kuala Lumpur? What about this band from Nepal? All these bands that I know, and like, if I need to, find out what's going on with them. I'm like, I'm just on my phone, like what's happening to them directly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I'm like, damn, why don't I just start my own, right? Just start my own and focus it on bands from here in this area and just see what happens. I had no idea, no inclination that, that people would actually fall in love with it. Like people actually use it at a, as a resource. I had no idea. Now, even seven and a half years later into it, I still don't know. It still boggles the mind when people are like, hey, hey, people are really sharing that article. I'm like, which article? You know, because I write like 12 a day. I'm like, I don't, what are we talking about? I have no idea. But the whole point of that site was that all these great bands, like you said, no excuse, right? People outside of Indonesia, outside of Jakarta may not even know who that band is, but they're this phenomenal straight edge hardcore band that clearly knows the roots to it. You know what I mean? They mm-hmm. clearly are well-versed on Youth of Today and In My Eyes, like all these bands. Yeah. And they've created their own music. And I'm just like, how do I make sure that they're not just obscure, that people just forget them when the band breaks up? Because that's what happens. Asian bands do so well in their own little tiny communities, their own little pockets. Then when the band breaks up, it's just they never existed. And so that's what United Asia was. It's just like, you know, like you're saying, there's thousands of pages. Once you start, you're just, it's going to, you're going to take hours, days to go through all of it. But I just want a place where, where people don't get, bands don't get forgotten. Mm-hmm. Like a living archive almost. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I really love, especially what you said about taking the need, seeing a need and basically just when nothing's happening, you fill it, you just yeah. take over. I love that aspect of of being in hardcore where it's DIY. You just make that shit happen. Like you have no idea how to build a website or you have no idea how to write stuff, but you learn. You yeah. just do it. Exactly. I fucking love that. I love that so much. And and you know, you going over and starting uh, uh, King Lychee in 2000 before there was kind of a hardcore band in Hong Kong and and doing all this like. I have so much respect for people like you that that do that. They just take it and make it their own it's fucking amazing to watch and thank see you, what it is now like yeah yeah thank you i mean it's, it's, it's huge it's crazy yeah because i mean people still talk about like the early days like i mean when we started in 99 literally i'm not even joking like it there there was maybe like a handful of heavy bands in hong kong in all of hong kong we're decided new york city we're decided yeah. new york city and there was just a handful of heavy bands and the bands back then were mainly playing covers so they would get on stage and, and there's like, you know, there's like a language issue too. Like, so I'd come back and I'm like, huh, why is this band getting on stage with a DJ and braids calling themselves a hardcore band, but they're going into like a, like a corn cover or a Limp Bizkit cover. And I'm like, there's something going on. But instead of making fun of it, like I never, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm not like, right. Why, why are you dancing like that? Or why are you stage diving? Like, like, I don't, it's not, I really don't care. I'm, you're having a good time. Great. But I just did what I wanted to know. What it wasn't again, like we're, we're saying here, this whole DIY culture. I'm like, there's a gap. They're not getting the information properly. So I started with mm-hmm. King Lai I started like an underground bilingual zine called Start from Scratch, and that's when I did like interviews with like uh, people in the states or people all over the world who are straight edge, vegan, vegetarian, had anti racist ideals, and like I just wanted to interview these people, translate it to Cantonese, and then get the word out that way, so that people slowly were like, oh, so the the main publications in Hong Kong completely have this wrong. You know what I mean? And so it was just that whole idea. Like now it's just crazy because people can just Google it, right? Yeah. What is hardcore? <laughs> they can just Google yeah. it all now. They have all this information. They have YouTube. How to make a hardcore song. <laughs> they break it down for you. Like, how, the, how to how to mosh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What is two-step? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's immediately when you go on United Asia, it feels like 
a zine. So I, I do love that because I remember going to like smaller shows, uh, I guess in like the MySpace days and, you know, people would like local kids would be making like a zine or some shit like that. It was always fun. So, but it's like the biggest zine I've ever seen in my whole life. So it's <laughs> fucking amazing. <laughs> um, Thanks, dude. Much uh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, aside from, I know that you've been active with Regret. Is that your newer project? Yeah, I mean, uh, like you were stuck in, uh, in in COVID lockdown hell, you're just like aching to do something. And so you started <laughs> this great podcast. And so my situation was, again, it gets kind of complicated, but Hong Kong is a, like an island type of city. And so my drummer of King Lai at the time, his name is Ivan, great drummer. He's actually from Macau, <laughs> which is another island. And so during COVID, both these cities had lockdowns. And so they were restricted from going to each other. You know, so you couldn't travel here. I couldn't travel there. So the last time I saw him was 2020. <laughs> and we're literally a 45-minute boat ride away or something like that. Like, oh it's gosh. crazy. So because he couldn't come, so King Lai Chi was on hold. Oh, no, sorry. King Lai Chi had already broken up by then. Uh, this was 2020, right? King Lai Chi had broken up by I started a band called Dagger with him. Um, and then uh, Dagger was on hold because he lives over there. I was just aching to get music out. So then it was Regret was more like a, a COVID project band. And we had mm-hmm. assumed like once the COVID restriction would be gone, that uh, we would just get that band rolling. But unfortunately for me, the drummer Regret also lives in Macau. <laughs> So last summer in 2021, the old classic lineup of King Lai Chi who all live here, <laughs> we're mm-hmm. like, how about we just get back together? So that's that's go. the tip I've been on. <laughs> okay. I was trying to make sure I wanted to see what you had going on. Yeah. Uh, that was what I was because I saw that you had regret. You had the the EP out, which is fucking awesome. I Thank love you. the the dual vocal aspect of it. Yeah. It's like so cool. And then the song that y'all have where I think uh, there's four languages in the yes. breakdown Yes. where you speak, you speak Urdu and, and there's the other members speak, you know, four different languages. It's fucking awesome. Thank you. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, uh, I'll be sure to put the links to to the EP from regret. Um, the most current dagger stuff, which I fucking love dagger. I still go back and listen to um, there's like a couple of splits in the EP, the EP from Taylor. Yes. Sounds fucking awesome. That was amazing. Right. Oh my God. It's so good. <laughs> I mean, because we did that band, uh, that EP. I mean, we we just recorded it in our practice studio. So Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in front of my amp, blaring at me with these headphones on, with the singer next to me, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna play this riff now. Just hit play, and like the feedback is roaring out. There was no wall in between us, and so like it just everything was bleeding into it. And we gave it to Taylor, and like he just did his magic. And I'm like, holy crap, this sounds so heavy. And what's sick about Taylor is he does not use samples, really. He doesn't use, like, uh, amp sims and stuff. He literally does, like, the real amp sound, the real yeah. drum sound. And yeah. he makes that shit sound magical. Yeah. So, love it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was cool because when we appro- approach people like that, because um, we live in Hong Kong, man. We're not really connected to, like, you know, the current happenings anywhere on the planet, but especially in the U.S. And so when we hit up some of these people, like, we're like, oh, man, are they going to reply? Blah, blah. Why, you know, he not only replied, he gave me his Facebook. You know what I mean? He's just like, here, just talk yeah. to me on Facebook. <laughs> so this is, I mean, this is back then, right? So I, I mean, mm-hmm. so we would just be on Messenger, like on like you know, the Facebook Messenger app, just going back and forth about like, hey, can you turn this up? Can you turn that up? And it was just like, oh, like, dude, this is so cool because I mean, yeah. he comes from that world, that more heavier side of hardcore. He's like, and he and he wants every band that he works with. I mean, this is what I felt every band he works with, he wants them to pop off, right? So like when we mm-hmm. gave him the stuff and he starts sending stuff back, we're like, oh my God, this is incredible. He's like, he's like, I need feedback though. I'm like, I don't know what to give you. <laughs> like, it sounds so good. <laughs> sounds better than I could even imagine. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, he's, he's from the people that I've talked to dealing with him, he seems like such a great dude to work with. So and good. I mean, his mixes speak for themselves. So yeah, I love I love listening to the dagger stuff. I mean, King Lychee is legendary. So enough said there. Uh, are you guys going to release any new music? Are y'all writing new stuff? What's going on with uh, with you guys? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, uh, King Lychee, like I said, we got back together last year, um, not knowing who would be interested in this besides the four of us. You know, like, and this is like more like a classic lineup of King Lychee. Like, uh, 
And what I mean by that is just like the, the one that really popped off here in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And so th- that album that we released with that lineup was called Stand Strong. It was a, a, a bilingual release. So we had every song had English and Cantonese in it, not Mandarin, Cantonese in it. So in, in Hong Kong, with all the stuff that's been going on, like uh, we've become way more can- pro-Canto here in Hong Kong, which, <laughs> which of course makes sense. Everyone should be very proud of their languages and dialects of their own city, mm-hmm. wherever they're from in the world. And so because of that, when people found out like that version of King Lachi came up or back, dude, it exploded here. I mean, we've because of the quarantine stuff, I mean, uh, the COVID restriction, we only played a handful of shows, but the shows that we played are all sold out within within hours of tickets going up, which I've never experienced that, dude. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> I've been in that band for 20 plus years. I'm like, wait, our show sold out? How did that happen? Like we the first show back was in December. It wasn't, we, we didn't organize another per, a group of people organized and they were like younger. So they didn't see King Lai G in that era or like during the heyday of the band. So I don't think they expected it. Right? They're like, yeah, okay, you know, we'll, we'll have you guys play, but it, it's our event. I'm like, yeah, cool, whatever, man. It's all good. Dude. And within like 90 minutes, like, I don't know, I don't think it was like 300 tickets. I don't know what it was. Sold out. And he's just like, what are you guys? <laughs> He's just like, we had so many events, nothing has gone like this. I'm like, I don't know. That's funny. Yeah. So, I mean, anyway, uh, to answer your question, yes, uh, we have about four new songs. And so the first one's about to come out in about probably end of August or so. Are you guys going to tour? Is it possible for you guys to to, Dude. to take it? Yeah. I mean, we'd love to. I mean, we have, but we have this whole quarantine bullshit that we have to deal with still. So, and we can leave the city, but since coming back, we all have to quarantine at a hotel for seven oh, days, God. you know, like not at home. I mean, if it was at home, it would be like, at least we could save some money or whatever, but at a hotel, dude, like these are expensive. Like so people are paying up to like 3000 us dollars extra just for the hotel quarantine. So uh, many of us, like I haven't left in three years. I haven't left Hong Kong since 2019. I'm losing my mind. So yeah, I mean, touring is, is something that we all want to do, but currently we can't, there's just no, there's no light at the end of this long, dark tunnel we've been on since 2019. Damn. I, I really hope that it lets up soon. Um, I, I know that it's kind of hard to keep track of what restrictions and where we were yeah. locked down for like two years solid. So I feel... Yeah. I feel that shit. Um, but, you know, luckily we've kind of, we've kind of, I guess, tapered off is what they would say. Um, so hopefully you guys get out of it soon. I would love to see King Lychee here in, in Montreal. I think that shit would be really cool. Maybe a lot of people don't know it yet, but they would love that shit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really hope everything goes well for you guys. Like I'm super happy that it's the original lineup. I think that speaks so much for what you guys are and what y'all started out as. So really awesome to see everything. Thank you, man. It means, it means a lot that anyone, anywhere on the planet <laughs> uh, has any idea who we are, or what we've done or what we've been about. Man. I, mean, I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. You have to thank David. He, he, David is, he's like, he gasses every one of his friends from that side of the world up. He's like, Hey, there's a lot of cool shit over there. And so he puts a bunch of people on. Shout yeah. Out David. I mean, David, uh, David's but- a man. David's a man, dude. Like I, and anyone that is, and that's the cool thing about anyone that's really like done their time in Asia. Um, and I don't mean, I, I mean, this might sound weird, but when people do come here and live for a couple of years, they kind of live in their own little bubble. That's what mm-hmm. we typically, we typically call it the expat bubble. Right. So a lot right. of like Westerners who come here and then find other Westerners and they just hang out amongst Westerners. But David's one of those kind of guys is like, yeah, that's cool that I'm a Westerner, but I want to know what locally is going on. You know what I mean? And so he like throws himself into the local bands and people that do that are always just like blown away. They're like, I can't believe this stuff exists here. You know. And so mm-hmm. like, how do I tell more people about it? So David is the, is the champion. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a real one. Uh, I love him to death. So yeah. I'm so happy that he was able to connect us. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Riz. Like, like I said, I was really expecting to have an awesome uh, discussion. So, you know, I feel like I've learned a lot. I hope that everybody listening has learned a lot. Uh, and it's been like just a, such a treat. I, I have one last question for you before we before we call this thing. What's your favorite city for beans and breakdowns? Yeah, and I've been thinking about this because you asked this question at the end of every one. I'm like, shoot, what is my favorite city? Um, yeah, I, I mean, 
as someone that hasn't left this city yet with all the crap that's going on, I mean, Hong Kong is my favorite city on the planet, even, even with what is happening to it and how unrecognizable it seems right now. Uh, there, there's a reason why some of us haven't left yet. You know, like we feel like mm-hmm. we're like the, the last remaining protectors of this place and what it used to be about. So yeah, Hong Kong is number one. It's awesome. Um, like I said, I have so much, I guess, sentiment and respect for, for you and, and that scene and everything that you guys are kind of going through right now. And like, there's a lot of us that are sending positive vibes, whether through messages or just, you know, you guys are like really in our thoughts. So I appreciate uh, I it. hope that you guys stay strong, stay healthy. Everything, oh, yeah. uh, Thank you. Ho- hopefully things will, will turn out a bit better soon, but. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this time too. This, this was such a great conversation. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, coming on and hanging out. Uh, we'll be looking out for for new King Lychee. Hell yeah. Take care. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beans and Breakdowns. I want to say a huge thanks to Riz for hanging out on the podcast. Uh, if you're interested in checking out all the projects that he's got going on, including Unite Asia, be sure to check out the links in the description. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. You can also find out more information about the podcast by following us on Instagram at Beans and Breakdowns or on the web at beansandbreakdowns.com. Also, thanks to everybody who came out to Church of Hardcore. It was awesome getting to meet everybody that bought a cold brew and a Uh, t-shirt. Thanks for coming out. Also, huge thanks to Danielle at Balance for setting up the cold brew. It was super delicious and it was a huge hit. So thanks, Danielle. Well, until next week, make sure to stay caffeinated and wake the fuck up. <laughs>